Would you accept that although in, it, in the, the activity of curing, as a healer, you can be subjective, but when you want to test and demonstrate that your methods work, that there you have to be objective and use scientific I methods. think we may have to revise our protocols there because the purely uh, objective method uh, uh, of uh, studying, uh, say, medical outcomes uh, excludes the very thing we are talking about, and that is consciousness. You know, you can have two patients who have the same disease, they see the same physician, they have uh, the same treatment, and they have completely different outcomes some of which, of course, can be explained through genetics. Uh, but a lot of it um, is really inexplicable unless you include the subjectivity of the patient, the patient-doctor interaction, the phenomenon of limbic resonance, which is emotional bonding between healer and the one being healed, which actually is now known to res uh, result in homeostasis, which is a very important part of the healing process. Nevertheless, if you were to get a 1,000 patients mm -hmm. and divide them up into two groups, and half of them are, are um, treated by limbic resonance or quantum healing, whatever you like, and the other half are treated by sort of conventional medicine that you learned as a, originally as a doctor, um, wouldn't you think there's an interest in detecting any difference between the effectiveness of those two treatments objectively? There is, except that even in those cases, 30% uh, of responses are what are called placebo responses. And, uh, you know, even though we try and control for placebos, you can't. So can I just ask, did everybody hear that? Because I was struggling a little bit to hear it. I think it's probably easier for them. Okay, it's easier yeah, for yeah. them. Did you hear it? Just about. It's, it's harder up here because the loudspeaker's facing that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess what I really wanted to ask you, and I realize, of course, I've just taken a very short clip, mm. but what's so crazy about that? Uh, <laughs> you, haven't heard, you haven't heard the half of it. Um, <laughs> I have actually. I heard the whole clip, but yeah. but just that bit. No, there... I mean, uh, I, I mean th that particular bit was about testing uh, medical te techniques, and and I was trying to suggest that that how whatever language he wants to dress his methods up in and call them quantum healing and quantum this and quantum the other and so on. Um, uh, if if we actually do a double blind control trial, um, then uh, he should submit to to that to see whether it actually does work. And it wasn't clear to me whether he was, uh, he then brought up the placebo effect, which of course is very important. Placebos do work. Um, that's why religion works. Um, <laughs> but um, that's why medical re researchers use placebos as controls to see whether, whether um, Yes, no, absolutely. And, and look, he, he very quickly, you know, conceded that he was, you know, on board with double-blind placebo-controlled trials. But I guess what was sort of interesting is that he, he's going after something where I think, in fact, um, science has not um, been, is, is just starting to get on to some of the things that more ancient uh, forms of medicine have uh, long argued. So, for instance, we now have brain scanning that's showing us a lot more about how placebos are working and not just that they work. So is everybody on board with what a placebo is? Okay, so what we know is that if you, for instance, there's a, an amazing guy who um, Richard and I have spoken about before, a guy named Dan Arelli who suffered burns up to 70% of his body when he was a child. He was basically spent a year in a burns unit and he saw people screaming in pain, the nurses would give them saline and they actually would stop being in pain. So he was witnessing that. He then went on to do some more research. And so now there's sort of fantastically interesting research that says we actually make the drug in our body that we believe the placebo to be. So if I tell you the sugar pill is a mood lifter, you'll be less depressed. If I tell you it's a painkiller, the part in your brain that, that kills pain will light up. And they also are now talking about, and it's, it's an area that they're calling neuroimmunology, epigenetics. And they're saying that what they think might be going on, for instance, with something like meditation, which we poo-pooed for so many years as having any impact on disease, may be um, impacting us because it's in, um, enacting the relaxation response, which is helping um, our body switch on and off diseases to inhibit, to start disease processes. So does that mean that we, we were too dismissive? 
what that is showing is that science will show what works. And you've, you've I mean, uh, if scientific methods can come along and show that some traditional remedy, some traditional meditation, or whatever it might be, uh, works, then it becomes incorporated into medicine. Um, what, we, what we don't want to do is to say um, that something like homeopathy, which uh, is traditional and, and which uh, has never been shown to work and almost cannot be shown to work because there's no difference between the control and the, and the experimental. Um, if, by some extraordinary fluke, um, it turned out, that, I mustn't use the word fluke, if it, if it turned out that homeopathy did work, that would be a wonderful scientific finding. I mean, that would be the, the, the homeopath who actually demonstrated that homeopathy worked would not only win the Nobel Prize for medicine, they, they'd win the Nobel Prize for physics as well, because it would... <laughs> Well, pre presumably any effect you get with homeopathy is all down to placebo because, as you say, it's been tested quite extensively. But I guess what well, interests... No, more, more, to, more to the point, that there's no difference between the, the bottle that contains the dose and the bottle that contains the, uh, the control. Um, it's been calculated that for the most effective, according to the homeopaths, you know they think that the more dilute it is, the more effective it is, not the less effective it is. Mm. Um, the, most, the, the, the highest doses, which they, they really, really rate, um, there, there would be one molecule of the active ingredient in a volume of water the size of the solar system. <laughs> so, what, what's interesting, though, I guess for me in all of this, is how do we, as people who, because I only started paying attention to this stuff exactly as you said, when the science started bringing in the results and explaining very right things and proper. that yeah. other practitioners in my world, because um, as you may know, traditional Chinese medicine is now a, a, a nationally registered um, health practice in Australia. So I know some traditional Chinese medicine practitioners. They've been saying some of the stuff that science is now validating for hundreds and hundreds of years. So the question becomes, how do we go about, prior to the validation by science, treating the claims that come to us from alternative um, health uh, practitioners and, and um, areas. Well, I hope that doesn't include using parts, body parts from tigers, etc., which is what, one of the problems that... I'll tigers. speak to him about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but um, of course, medical science needs to test all sorts of new, new drugs, new, new things. I mean, aspirin comes from the bark of a willow tree uh, and, and so on. Of course we need to do that. There's no particular reason to expect that it'll come from some um, superstitious tradition than that it'll come from any, anywhere else. But, but test it. If it works, it becomes part of medicine. Um, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't become part of medicine. In the case of homeopathy, um, what they claim is that even though there are no molecules left in the uh, shaken um, uh, dose, the, the water has a memory which picks up. Um, well, I mean, you can laugh, but, but, but it, it could be true. Um, and you could demonstrate it to be true. As I said, if, one, if a homeopath could demonstrate it to be true, they would win the Nobel Prize for physics and for medicine. But are they beavering away trying to prove it true? No, they're not. They're beavering away making money out of gullible idiots. <laughs> this is a, um, a, what's called a, a donkey. Well, it's called a donkey. I know you'll be surprised to learn that. Um, it's a female donkey, so it's called a Jenny, actually, which I think is a beautiful name. Um, and the reason I'm, I've brought it up is because um, in the last few days, a scientist has contacted me um, because she's been very concerned about um, this process of making animals Judas animals. And the process is basically where they take animals that are feral animals, so they might be goats, they might be donkeys, they might be wolves, depending on where you are. They put a collar around them, a radio collar, and then because the animals are naturally sociable, they send them out to find their fellows. And when they find their fellows, the human beings come along in planes and they shoot the whole pack of them, and then they leave the other animal, the Judas animal, to find more of its fellows so that they can, they're basically using the animal as yeah. a tracker. And I just wondered, um, in, so that's been happening in, since 1994 in Northern Australia. 
It's happening with feral goats in New South Wales and Queensland, and it's happening with wolves in Canada because they're trying to preserve caribou. So these, the reasons that it's being done, of course, are for environmental preservation or fauna preservation reasons. They're trying to preserve things. But I just wonder what you think of the ethics of it. Okay, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that at all. Um, you, above all, might worry about the name Judas, um, uh, <laughs> having, having written this wonderful book, um, which, I, which I strongly recommend, the book, of, the book of Rachel, in which, at least as far as I've got, um, Judas is a bit of a hero. Um, or may maybe he doesn't end up that, that way. Yes. Okay, okay well, we, I, I, I haven't Don't got to the end. Don't spoil it. Nobody knows how that story ends. I haven't got to the end yet. Um, I mean, I, I, I am concerned about cruelty to animals, and uh, I, I, don't, um, I don't want to condemn outright conservation measures which um, involve um, removing feral animals in the interests of uh, conserving, preserving wild animals. I mean, for example, on the Galapagos Islands, which are dear to my heart and to that, that, that the heart of any Darwinian, feral goats re re released on some of the islands um, have had a disastrous effect on the ecology. Um, so given that you are going to uh, you're, given that you're going to cull, say, feral goats, um, it's not obvious to me that, re that releasing Judas goats is not a good way to do it. I mean, it, it, I, I, I wouldn't moralize about that. If I was going to moralize, it would be about killing them at all, I think. Well, well go ahead, moralize about that. Well, um, <laughs> I, I, I think that, that you can moralize about animal suffering, and I, and I would be happy to, to do that. Um, but um, conserving rare species which, are, um, which, which have lived there for many, many generations um, against the, not depredations, but, but competition from things like goats or rats, um, it can have a disastrous effect on the ecology of a country when a foreign animal is introduced, like rabbits to Australia, like Australian possums to New Zealand. Um, but what does it justify us doing? That's what the interesting question is. So we have myxomatosis here for we were using as a way of killing rabbits, for instance, and then it was deemed that there was just too much suffering in, in terms of how it was done. So is there a line that we have to draw in terms of what we're willing to do, or given that the, the needs are so are critical in terms of whatever we're trying to achieve, yes. we can do anything? Um, I, I do feel passionately about animal suffering. Um, and I, I have one contribution to make to that. Um, Jeremy Bentham said the question is not can they think, can they reason, but can they suffer? And I think we rather too readily assume that uh, suffering is a, a prerogative of intelligent species. Um, it's certainly true that humans are the only species that can do many, many different kinds of reasoning, kinds of intelligence. We are, we are the only one that had language and so on. But suffering is not something for which you need intelligence. Uh, there's no reason to suppose that a goat or a donkey is less capable of feeling pain than a human. And the extra contribution that I would make is there might even be a reason for them to be more capable of feeling pain for the following reason. What is pain for? In a Darwinian sense, what pain is, is a warning to the animal, don't do that again. If an animal does something which leads to it feeling pain, that's telling the animal, next time you do that, it might kill you. Mm. Well, um, if pain is a warning to not repeat what you've done, isn't it possible that a more intelligent species actually needs less pain in order to teach it the lesson of not to, not to repeat that unwise action? So although I'm not actually advocating the idea that uh, less intelligent species feel more pain, I think I am advocating the idea that, there's, that they probably, that they, there's, there's no reason to suppose that more intelligent species feel, feel more pain. Um, What's interesting about the Jennies is that they eventually do learn that they are actually the source of all the murders, and so they eventually banish themselves 
to, to their oh, own sort well, of space. Okay, so they, well, they do eventually learn. I'm quite surprised at that. Mm. I wondered if you had any advice for people about Twitter, because I, I tweet. Um, I'm assuming some people out there tweet. Um, and th I think we're still in the, in the stage of developing Netiket or whatever we want to call it around how we, yes. how we manage these social media, especially um, immediate ones like Twitter. Yes. I think one of the mistakes that uh, that I make, and probably a lot of people make, is to um, get into a an, an exchange on Twitter where where you're, you know, there's a whole series of tweets, which makes sense if you've been following all of them, but forgetting that many of your readers haven't been following all of them, and therefore um, tweet number eight, um, which makes sense to anybody who's been following numbers one to seven. Standing out on its own, number eight is vulnerable to, to misunderstanding, and that's pretty much inherent in the um, in, in the 140 character limit. Um, one of the things I've I've learned to do is to is to chain them together by replying to myself, and then deleting my name. So if you if you do that, if you if you find an, an if you find the the earlier one of the series that you've been doing reply to yourself, delete your own name, and then they come out linked um, with, a, with a line. Is someone taking notes? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really clever, because I, I agree with you that the, that the decontextualized nature of it. Yes. One of the things I think is interesting too is though, when email ca first came out, and I know some people are too young here to really kind of remember that, but when we were getting used to email, you had to develop that rule after you'd made your first mistake of if you were feeling a bit hot-headed about something, yeah. that you wouldn't press that send sleep button. Sleep on it. Yeah. You'd sleep on it, that's yeah. right. And of course, 99 times out of 100, you'd never end up sending it. Yeah. But Twitter's such an immediate medium. Would that ever work with tweets? Well, I think you've, you've got to be very, very careful. And, and I mean, but various people have, have suggested to me, try not to respond to, th to, to individuals who are, who, I mean, it's a little bit like, um, when you're walking down the street and somebody yells some obscenity at, at, at you, you just walk on by. Um, but Twitter enables that obscenity to be uh, sort of thrust into your amplified, face. Amplified, yes. and also amplified yeah. to other people. Well, it, fortunately, not all that many other people, because mostly the people who do that don't have very many followers. So, <laughs> so, um, but but, but you, you have to remind yourself of that, and you have to remind yourself Look, don't worry. This is just the random drunken yob who ye who's yelling obscenities in the, in the street. Um, uh, if you if you bother to look how many followers he's got, um, you well, you'd you see you see the troll yeah. numbers, yeah. don't you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think. Okay. So we're we're going to go to questions to, from the audience. So maybe if we could get the house lights up and put your hands up. Don't hesitate. Okay. There's some microphone fairies around. Oh, uh, no, sorry, you'll have to wait like everyone else. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, hi, Richard. Hello. Love your work. Um, you've been taken to task by various so-called um, religious intellectuals and, and accused of being uh, unsophisticated uh, on uh, terms of philosophy. I, I just wonder if you have any, any response to that. I'm thinking in particular of folks like David Bentley Hart, who've uh, hit you up on the, um, the argument for, uh, about God from infinite regress and uh, suggested that's a category error. I, I just wonder if you, you have any response to the, to the suggestion that you, you, you are just philosophically unsophisticated. Ah, uh, yes, I do. Um, uh, what we're talking about here is the argument um, from the improbability of complexity. Uh, as a Darwinian biologist, I'm in the business of explaining the prodigious, the stupefyingly prodigious complexity and elegance and illusion of design of living things. 
This is presumably why it took so long for a Darwin to come on the scene, because the, uh, the illusion of design in living creatures is so, is so powerful. It really looks as though they've been designed. Living bodies are so incredibly complicated, statistically improbable. They couldn't possibly have come about by chance. Absolutely not. So Darwin solved that problem. They don't come about by chance. They come about by a slow, gradual process of accretion, a slow, gradual process of cumulative natural selection, which builds up step by step by step from simple beginnings to complex endings. Simplicity, by definition, is easy to understand. Complexity needs an explanation. God, if he is to do what is required of him in creating the universe, in devising the laws of physics, in setting the physical constants, in starting evolution going, in uh, keeping evolution going, in uh, forgiving our sins, in listening to our prayers, in deciding which cancer patients to cure and which to let die, um, a god would have to be a supremely complicated, elegant, improbable thing of exactly the kind of, exactly the kind of thing which we are in the business of explaining. To postulate a god at the outset of everything is therefore to defeat the entire scientific enterprise. It is to evade the responsibility to explain. Explaining things, explaining complex things, is the great triumph of science, especially Darwinian science, but all of science. Uh, I and many others have pointed out that the explanation God did it is no kind of explanation at all. It's a complete cop-out. Uh, it's an explanation that shoots itself in the foot because it sets out, because it uh, begins by assuming that which it's trying to explain. Now, so-called sophisticated theologians object to this by saying, oh, but we theologians have always said that God is outside time and outside space and therefore is not subject to those um, strictures. Um, and uh, some, some theologians have even gone so far as to say, we theologians have always said that God is infinitely simple and therefore doesn't need any explanation. Well, if he's infinitely simple, he can't possibly do the things that he's supposed to do. That, again, is a complete evasion of the responsibility um, to uh, explain. So I have no time whatsoever for that kind of so-called sophisticated theology. So is my next person up there? Hello. Um, I think my microphone's on over here. Oh, OK. Sorry, yeah, we're, we're struggling okay. to see. Can we get um, rid of Deepak while we're, while we're oh. there? Oh. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Dawkins, it would appear that uh, science has proved that the current British uh, monarchy has no legitimate claim to their throne, <laughs> in view of the fact that since analysing Richard III's remains and his DNA, that uh, a stray Y chromosome has passed the sheets uh, of the royal bed, or perhaps John of Gaunt, so that Henry VII was not a legitimate descendant of the Plantagenets. So that means the entire British line since 1485 is illegitimate. Do you think I worry about that? <laughs> Actually, we were just reading that in the paper in the green room before we came on, and I was curious to know, um, I understand they've got the DNA from Richard III because his corpse has been found in a car park in Leicester. Um, <laughs> but um, whose DNA did they compare it with in order to, um, to conclude this? Because Edward III was mentioned, and I don't believe anybody's got any of Edward III's DNA. So I'm a little bit... Sorry? There's some faulty logic OK, there. Some, some of the current aristocracy, presumably not including the current royal family. I, I, so, no, I mean, it, I, I'm interested in this kind of thing. It's, it's fascinating. Um, uh, it, it wouldn't, um, since, since I'm not a great monarchist anyway, it, 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 it's, not, it's not a good thing that's going to disturb me uh, one way or the other. And I'm 
or for further scientific research on the subject. It certainly validates the Jewish fear that you should, you ought to be um, it, it through the mother, yes. hereditary through yeah. the mother. Uh, that's that's correct. Yes, that's right. I mean, because it, for, for the obvious reason that, that that you can be more sure of your, of you your mother. You always know who the mother is. Although, e even that, in the case of royal babies, was not entirely the case. Sometimes, weren't they smuggled in in warming pans and things? Would, um, no, I thought, I thought I thought they were. Um, but, it, but it's true that, that we, we now know r roughly what percentage of, of individuals are actually the, the children of the father that they think they're, they're, they're of. And so if you multiply the probability over every generation, um, the chance that any of us is descended from our, our surname ancestor is rather low. <laughs> That's not right. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Richard. Um, I was just wondering, you do a, a number of talks around the world. Uh, are there any times that you, being an atheist and an outspoken atheist, or um, agnostic, I should, sorry, agnostic, um, I was just wondering, are there any times that you, you kind of have a bit of fear that uh, you're not safe, that, that you kind of risk some idiot somewhere doing something? No. Um, no. no? Next question. <laughs> Um, have you got a microphone? Yeah. Good up. I just got a question. Um, I just want to know if picking on a vulnerable minority like Australian people who identify as Islamic, does that lead them away from their religion? Or identifies that what? Sorry. Them back? Identifies what? Australian women and children who right. identify as Islamic, when we pick on them, does that lead them away from their religion or does that drive them back into it? Uh, I'm not psychologist enough to know the answer. I, I doubt if you could generalize. It's probably true of some and not of others. Um, so I don't think I'm really qualified to answer that. Uh, the point has been put to me that um, attacking somebody's beliefs in general is likely to drive them further into it. And that may be true of some people, but, but not others. And, and this is actually a dispute among um, colleagues who, who, who are, um, write books and things about, about atheism. Um, some of us ab adopt a so-called seductive approach, and, and some, of, some of us adopt a, a, a more in-your-face um, approach. And I suspect that the two approaches work for different people. Um, we've got, we've got a qu another question up there. Hi, Richard. Um, this actually follows on a little bit from that, because we are in the middle of the information revolution. We've had the internet for about 30 years now. We've got more people having more access to more information than humanity's ever known at any point in history. And yet it seems like we are still facing the same arguments. People are getting more and more entrenched. What I'm trying to say is it doesn't seem like we're making any headway in fighting against the false beliefs that are out there. Do you agree with that sentiment that false beliefs seem to be just as entrenched as ever? Have you seen any way forward to like getting rid of false beliefs or reducing their impact? And would you be interested in a way? I, I am interested. I, I don't think the data support your pessimism, actually. Um, I think that um, if you look at uh, poll data, at census data, uh, in most Western countries, if not all Western countries, you'll see that there has been a steady decline in religious affiliation uh, over the decades. Um, even the United States, which is lagging way behind Western Europe, uh, it, that there is a steady decline in religious affiliation to the point where now I think some 20% of Americans claim no religious affiliation. Uh, in Britain, the uh, figure for people who call themselves Christian declined in the 10 years from 2001 to 2011 uh, from about 73% uh, to 54%. That's a big drop. Um, I would expect the si a similar result in Australia, although I don't know. Uh, in Scandinavia, in, in France, uh, in Germany, it's a similar story. So I'm more optimistic uh, about this than, than, you, than you are. Uh, it's probably not the case in the Islamic world, although I don't know that, and it's much more difficult to get, to get data. I keep getting letters from Iran saying, keep up the good work, we're, we're with you, but we just don't dare say so. <laughs> uh, 
and Turkey. And um, yeah. Look, I'm going to call up. Oh, sorry, yes. I didn't mean to interrupt yeah, you. Fine. Are you done? That's fine, yeah. um, Are there any women in this audience? Do any of them want to ask any questions? Because it would be good if the mic fairies could deliver a microphone to a woman. Um, okay, so we're yeah, going to do. One there, one there. Okay, so there is one. Um, well, we, I don't know how to connect. All right. Thank you. I'm even wearing a dress today. How good. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask, I've um, uh, come across some research done in America, genetic research on left-wing and right-wing voting preferences. Have you, have, are you familiar with that? And um, that some of the, um, well, one of the findings they <laughs> with that was that left-wing voters, um, through a visual preference study, were motivated by um, reward and optimism, and right-wing voters who had some genetic similarity were motivated by fear. Um, visual, that was the visual study. Have, are you familiar with that? Is it, is it um, justified research, or have you got any comments on the implications of that? Can you give me a reference to that? I, I, I saw it on Dateline on SBS. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would, I would love to follow that up. It, it sounds very interesting. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Yes, Dean. Oh, thanks. Uh, great to see we have some equality here. Um, on that, um, you spoke about fem feminism briefly, Richard. Um, mate, um, recently, you know, uh, feminists in, in Western countries have been slammed for fighting for things that seem a bit trivial in comparison to in countries, um, like in Muslim, co Muslim countries, like you touched on. Um, I'm a bit nervous to ask you this, depending on your answer, because I don't want you to face some sensationalist headlines, but um, what's your take on modern feminism in, in Western society, and do you feel like sometimes it seems a bit trivial? I've, I've said enough on that, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I, I said enough on that. I, I, I don't want to belittle uh, the problems of Western women. Um, I don't think we should be in the business of making comparisons like that if it has the effect of belittling. Um, but I do think we need to turn our attention to the plight of women in Islamic countries. And in particular, I want to get away from a tendency among Western liberals of both sexes to give a free pass to misogyny in Islamic countries because they're terrified of being called Islamophobic or racist. Uh, it's as though we nice, decent Western liberals are torn between uh, our fear of being thought racist or Islamophobic and our um, a dislike of misogyny to the extent that we bend over backwards in a rather patronizing and condescending way to excuse misogyny in Islamic countries uh, as though we're somehow saying, oh, well, you people over there, we can't expect you to, ad to abide by our high standards. And that is patronizing and condescending and contemptible. Okay, so where are my microphones? Have I got one there? Okay, there you go. Maybe I'll go there first. <laughs> Number six. Um, thank you, uh, Leslie and Richard. Leslie, you mentioned meditation earlier, and there's um, a lot of other pursuits such as um, looking at beautiful artwork, listening to music, um, just quiet time for reflection. These sorts of things are quite often referred to as food for the soul or spiritual pursuits. Um, as a sceptic and... Um, a non-believer of consciousness continuing after death, and also as a Tai Chi practitioner, which I, I really love to do, I would love to hear of some other terminology that we can use for, for these sorts of things. What do you suggest, Richard? Well, I, um, I, lo I love poetry, I love music. I've got a bit of a blind spot about visual art. Um, I've written a book about the relationship between um, the, the, the sciences and the arts called Unweaving the Rainbow. Um, 
the burden of the book really is to say that um, poets like Keats were wrong to criticize science for um, spoiling the poetry, uh, in particular case, the poetry of the rainbow, but, but, in, but in general. I think that science itself is one of the great aesthetic experiences. The, the contemplation of the heavens, the contemplation of life uh, is a, a, a great emotional experience. Um, and I, I don't want to, want to belittle up artistic experience as well. I think that they both have, they, they both belong, belong together. Um, you ask about terminology. Uh, I, 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 do you mean we want to get away from words like spiritual, which are, which are, can be misled loaded, as... Loaded words. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't mind using any words as long as we define them clearly and, and people don't misunderstand them, but of course people do misunderstand them. I mean, in some respects, I'm very happy to call myself a spiritual person, but uh, I've, I've got used to that being misunderstood, and so in some ways it's, it's better not to. I think Einstein um, would have called himself a spiritual person, and I think Einstein actually called himself a, a religious person, although he did not believe in a god. Yeah. So um, you've got to be quite careful in your, in your use of terminology, or you'll, you'll be... Uh, there are people out there who are eager to misunderstand. Thank you. Hi. Um, could you please comment on the fact that our federal government spends hundreds of millions of dollars putting chaplains into public <laughs> secular schools? Uh, I normally would pre preface my remarks by saying that I hesitate as an outsider um, to comment on such things, not being Australian. but. In this case, I think it's a bloody disgrace. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more. Who's got the mic? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, hi, Richard. I got a question. Um, what is your view on people who use religion if they're suffering severe adversity and that may actually prevent them from committing suicide or suffering severe depression? And if it does assist individuals or even groups of people in surviving, does it play a part in Darwinian evolution? That's very interesting. Um, uh, there is a certain amount of evidence that religious belief does protect against certain kinds of depression and certain kinds of stress-related diseases as well. Um, the first thing to say about that, of course, is that it doesn't make it true, and I hope, hope that's obvious. That there, um, there are people who simply can't get that point of logic. Um, but um, it's like a placebo. It's like a placebo, exactly. I mean, it's a very good example of the placebo effect. Um, I suspect it cuts both ways. I think there are many people who actually are driven to despair by their religious belief if they think that they're um, going to hell, uh, or if it um, has estranged them from their from their spouses or from their parents or their or their offspring or something of that sort. So it can give rise to a lot of of suffering as well. Um, preventing suicide, well, that's a, another possibility. Incidentally, uh, one of the main um, uh, objections to assisted suicide, doctor-assisted suicide, comes from religious people. And it's an interesting thought, which when you think about it is pretty obvious, that there are many people who commit suicide while they still are capable of doing so and probably would not commit suicide if they knew that when the time came, when they were no longer capable of doing it themselves, there was a doctor to help them. Very true. Um, so I want to close with this quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. It's a quote about inspiration, and Richard, you are a huge inspiration. So thank you very much for taking the opportunity.